Hi, everybody. My name is Hillel, and I would like to talk to you about designing distributed systems with TLA+, also known as everything about distributed systems is terrible, also known as, hey, waterfall, maybe that was a good idea. Um, I understand it's a bit, I understand that for many of you, it's currently the evening, in which case I am sorry, because this is a very dense talk. We're going to be covering what is distributed system, why they are so terrible, why a lot of the tools that we use to make them better don't quite help us, and how we can use things like TLA Plus to help, not fix it, I am not promising snake oil, but help. So before we begin, though, I want to say a couple of logistical things. First of all, as you can probably already tell, I talk very, very fast. It's a bad habit I have. I have told the moderators about it. I'm going to try to slow down, and if I am speaking too fast, Andre will poke me and tell me to slow down. So if you're a bit worried about that, don't worry, we have something in place for that. Two, as I mentioned, this is a pretty dense talk, and I understand it's in the evening for a lot of people right now, and it's probably sort of at the end of the conference day. So I put up the information at this site. You can see the specifications I'll be using. You can see supplementary materials. You can see questions people have asked. Of course, it'll also be available I will also be available later to answer questions, but you know, if you have to leave early, you can just email me and I'll put it up there. Okay, so with that, I think we're ready to begin. First of all, what do we mean by a distributed system? The canonical person to talk to right now is this person named Leslie Lamport, who is a major, major player in the distributed systems world. He did a lot of really important stuff. He came up with this very um, terse quote that Everybody who ever talks about a dis and tries to it is a system in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own unusable. It's funny. I also disagree with it. It covers some of the issues of dis -sims, but doesn't really get to the essence of what makes them so terrible. And to sort of emphasize what that is, I'd like to run through a couple of examples. Example number one. We have two computers. They are talking to a server that has a database. The first computer sets a value at temp and then increments the value and sets it back to the database. Second computer does the same. This, most people would agree, is a distributed system. We have multiple computers, and the failure of one can render another one unusable. Now, example two. Instead of two computers, we have two threads on one computer, and instead of a, and instead of a um, database, we just have a file. We're doing the exact same logic, but most people would say this is not a distributed system. Even though we're doing the same thing, the same kind of algorithm, something is different. So what makes the first example distributed and the second example not? History, actually. If you read the early literature by people who worked in the basics of multi-threading currency, people like Digstra, Decker, Newley, they talk about it in much the same way as we talk about multiple computers now. They were worried about partial failure, they were worried about sort of race conditions, they were worried about, um, they were worried sort of about like split brains and caps, etc. What happened was that as we improved hardware, we got the ability to essentially undistribute these algorithms. We were able to make them still concurrent, still multi-threaded, still difficult, but somehow managed to get rid of the thing that made us think of them as terrible distributed systems. And that's interesting for two reasons. One, it tells us that threads, computers, literally the same thing. Okay, not really, but what it does tell us is that both of these are actually unified under some higher abstraction. We can talk about the issues we face with both in some general principled way. With that, I want to introduce how I like to define distributed systems, something that can cover both early threading and modern multiple computers. That would be one where we have multiple agents. I'd use actors here, but that's been taken up by the actor model. And there's some global property of the system that they all share together. But at the same time, each one only has local information. If we have multiple workers, they know what they're working on, they might not know what other workers are working on. 
this is actually enough. Just those three properties are enough to introduce all of the faults of distance that we're worried about. Race conditions, partial failure, all that horrible stuff. That explains what a dissim is, but doesn't really capture the essence of why they're terrible. So I'd like to quickly go into some of the reasons why it's actually hard to reason about these things. What makes them so difficult and so dangerous in practice? So the first thing is caused by concurrency. This is the ability for multiple agents to work independently and run in some order. And the problem with this is something we call state space explosion. Let's say we have two agents. Could be computers, threads, people writing stuff in notebooks, whatever. There is some global value, x. The first agent atomically increments x. The second one atomically doubles x. These agents can run in either order. After they both run, what are the possible values that x could be? Think about that for like 20 seconds. Okay, so I imagine most of you think it would be probably two end values of x. Either we double then increment, in which case x is three, or we increment then double, x is four. In either case, we have to pass through an intermediate state where one has run and the other one has not. If an outside observer, if an outside observer froze time at that instant, they could see up to five different states the system could be in, different configurations of the global and local values that we can observe. They would also note two behaviors. That is a timeline that we follow through with the system. So I'm going to try something very dangerous here and try to use the laser pointer feature of, can you all, yeah. So we have one behavior that goes like this and one behavior that goes like this, two for total. Now, that's actually a pretty simple system. It's very tractable, only five states, two behaviors. You can easily reason through what we can see. The problem is that concurrency very quickly causes us to get out of hand. Change the problem. Instead of having atomically changing on um, x, we non-atomically change it. We first store the value locally into a temp variable, and then we set the global value of x equal to that plus the agent's action. Now, because these agents are running concurrently, we don't necessarily know which order these steps will happen. For example, we might start by doing agent two's assignment, and then agent one can run from start to finish, and then agent two finishes. So originally we had five steps and two behaviors. Next question for you to think about for 10 seconds. How many behaviors and states do we have now? So we had five and two. Now, by just adding one local step to each one, we now have 13 new states and eight new behaviors. And this actually gets really quickly out of hand very, very fast. In fact, the maximum number of possible states and behaviors, maximum number of possible states is defined by this equation. So if I had added a third agent that took two steps, I could have up to 540 possible states, distinct states. Basically, for any kind of interesting system, we have what's called state space explosion. The number of possible configurations of the system gets very big very quickly. That is the first principle of what makes dis sims so terrible. The number of states grows fast. But it's not just the state space that's a problem. Most people sort of get that. The more subtle issue is what's called the behavior space the number of possible ways we can navigate through a system, because that can grow even faster due to something called non-determinism. Our original model had two agents with two steps each, but they always did the same thing at each step. At a higher level, we might not want that. We might want to allow agents to fail or to do something incorrectly or to do something randomly. This is non-determinism. We allow in a step one of many possible things to happen. We could increment x by one, x by 2, or we could just crash. This incidentally gives us partial failure. 
Now, this doesn't do as much to the state space as concurrency does, but it can do some terrible things to the behavior space. New example, we have x is zero, two agents. One increments x if it's less than six, one decrements x if it's greater than zero. We only have about six states here, seven states. If I look at all of the behaviors that are five steps long, there's about 16 of them. Essentially, we can go like one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five, etc. Now, what I'm going to do is change one of these agents to make it non-deterministic. If x is less than five, it could increment by two. Or if it could increment by one, it could choose. This doesn't actually change the state space. We only still have seven states. But now we have a lot more ways to go through the system. I could do one, two, three, four, five, or I could do one, two, three, four, five. And now instead of 16 distinct behaviors, we have 113. Basically, any path we take through the state space forms a distinct point in the behavior space, almost an expanding cone of possibilities that spreads outward. This can grow ludicrously large, ludicrously quickly. The number of behaviors can grow even faster than the number of states can. Now, why do we care about this? We care about this because we want to make sure that everything in our system is safe, right? We want to make sure it's bug free. And a single state can be enough to make a system broken. People sort of get this. If this is a model of, say, an eventually consistent database, and this point over here represents the server being offline or us having dropped the database, that's a problem. We call this a safety violation. It's a bad state we never want to see. We don't even want it to be possible. Most people get that. What people don't quite often see immediately is that it's not just states that can be problems. Behaviors can be problems too. A behavior can cross through only valid states and still be incorrect. Imagine, I said this is eventually consistent, right? Imagine we have some sort of path where we want to commit the data, but never actually do. At any given state, the system is fine. There is nothing wrong with, there's no inconsistencies in our data. But the path we took means that we never actually did what we expected. This is called violating liveness. It is an invalid behavior. So it's not just states that can be a problem. Both states and behaviors can be problematic. Of course, we're dealing with huge state spaces, we're dealing with huge behaviors. Why is it a problem that behaviors and states are bad? Like maybe they just will just never reach them, even if they're possible, right? Except here's the last point with this sims. We're running these at scale. If we weren't, we wouldn't be using a distributed system. And the thing is that at scale, everything tends to happen. Imagine that we only have one in a billion events can trigger a bad behavior. So one in a billion. And we only process 100 events a second. That's nothing. I've worked at companies where we've had like five engineers and still 100 events a second easily hit during peak times. How long will it be before we see our first major failure from hitting that one in a billion chance? It's about three months. Every three months, the season changes and your system goes down. Essentially, over a long enough time, a system will do everything. This is also known as Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. And that's why distributed systems are terrible. There is such a large state and behavior space, and every single point of that is, always, is eventually hit at some point, that if something can go wrong, it will go catastrophically wrong. And because the state space is so big, there are many potential ways it could go wrong. So I'm not the first to notice this. This has been a large problem for a long time. And if there's a problem, programmers like to come up with solutions. In fact, they've come up with a lot of solutions. Some of these, like compare and swap, are so integrated into our hardware that we just don't even think about them anymore. 
some like locks and semaphores are pretty widely accepted and done at the software level. Some like transactions or nurseries or um, mo uh, monads are more on the cutting edge of things that we try to, that we're trying to sort of integrate more into the mainstream. And some like flow-based programming are kind of cult-like and people saying that it solves everything, which I don't quite trust. Now, I'm not saying these are bad tools. In fact, a lot of these are very good and a lot of these are necessary. But they all tend to share one major problem. And there's a reason none of these quite get what we're looking for. Can any of you see the problem that every single one of these has in common? I realize I can't actually get feedback from the audience, so I'll just tell you what's wrong with all of these. Their code, their implementations at the software level. What they do is that by implementing them, we've removed the number of possible states, the number of possible configurations the system can be in. But we don't have any guarantee that the rest of the state space is safe. All we're hoping is that we've managed to remove all of the invalid states this way. If we've used these tools to cut the state space into basically a quarter of what it was, but we missed the bad state or we missed the bad behavior, this is ineffective. In a sense, in order to actually solve concurrency issues, to solve distributed system issues, we need to be able to see the state space. We need to be able to see the behavior space. And these tools don't give us that. They can change it, but they don't help us understand it. Essentially, state space explosion and behavior space explosion are design problems. They're problems with how we build our system, how we model it, how we think about it. And code is not design. Code can't be designed. Code's not supposed to be designed. Code is code, not design. It can't solve design problems for us. The reason we tend to rely on code is because up until now, designs have been kind of terrible. Like code might be ineffective, but we can test it. We can take our code and run checks against it to make sure it works. And if we're building a distributed system, we presumably have a very complicated design. So me just throwing a binder of, of um, paper at you and saying, hey, I thought about this really hard, doesn't quite work. We need some way to test the design too. This hasn't really existed historically. People might have tried things like UML, but those are essentially still, to a great degree, ad hoc. It's only recently, well, I mean, it's only recently that in the mainstream, we've been thinking about a different possibility. What if we could write testable designs? Then we could test the designs directly and make sure they're correct. This is called formal specification. Specification meaning that it's a design, and formal meaning that it is so precise that a machine can actually test it for veracity. This gives us the best of both worlds. It lets us understand our state space and also check it. There are many tools that sort of work in this space and a lot of them are very good. The one I want to focus on is one that is not just only very good, but also has seen a lot of industrial use by companies, not academics. So with that, it's finally time to introduce. We get on time? It's time to finally introduce TLA+. So this is the brainchild of Leslie Lamport. I told you he'd come up again. He was very influential after all. And his idea was that instead of sort of expressing what we do, we express what's possible. So for example, this takes a lot of different like forms and it sort of pervades the entire way we think about a system. To give one example, we can talk about initial states versus just configuration. In a code, what I do is I say, hey, I'm passing in these variables or I'm calling it with these things. Here's the initialization. With TLA plus, I'm talking about what the system starts out as, all the possibilities. So I could say it, so I could say, assume the queue has zero messages to start, or maybe it has five, or maybe it has three. Then instead of sort of talking about what I do, I talk about how the system can evolve. To sort of give an example of what I mean here, in programming, I can say, we have a queue, we want to add a message, we're going to try to add a message. Then if the result succeeds, do this, and if the result fails, do that. That works, but what we're doing is essentially saying that our program can do this, and then the outside world might cause these effects. 
but that exists outside the program. It's not something that we can actually really control inside the program what ends up happening to the message. But that's totally fine at the design level. I could say in TLA plus, either we add a message to the queue, or we try to add a message and it fails, or we try to add a message and we accidentally add it twice. So essentially, it's not just the machine I'm representing here. I'm representing all the possibility of the environment. I'm saying it's all part of my design. And I can represent this thing that I can only react to in programming, proactive versus reactive. Similarly, like in programming, I could say, send a push notification to every device. In TLA Plus, I could say, allow some of the devices to get the notification, but not all of them. Some will drop it. And then I can model this too. Now where this really sort of comes to a head is that it's not just, I'm, ex I'm not just expressing what the system should do. I'm also expressing the properties it has, essentially my tests for the system. For example, I might put a requirement on the state space. I might say, there is always at least one server that is online in my deployment strategy. So this has to be true for every single state. I can also put requirements on my, on my behavior space. I could say, eventually, there is some point in the future for every behavior where every single server is online. So this doesn't have to be true at any specific state. We could be passing through states where this is not true. But we always have to hit at least one state in every behavior where this is true. This lets us talk about the timelines of our system, not just essentially the inputs and outputs. Am I speaking too fast? I'm not hearing any panic, so I'll assume I'm speaking. I'm not speaking too fast. So, and then fine. Oh, and then finally, once we actually have our system and our properties, what we can do is we can actually test them. We use what's called a model checker. In this case, something called TLC, to take the system and run through the entire space space, the entire behavior space, and see if every single thing satisfies our properties. If we have a violation, what happens is it can give us an error trace showing the exact sequence of states that causes the invalid state or behavior. Now, that's all sort of cool in theory, of course. I think it's pretty cool, but it's also something that most people haven't encountered. So just talking about an abstract just isn't that satisfying to me. It doesn't really like show you what this looks like. So for the next part of the talk, what I want to do is I want to actually show you this. I want to walk through an example that shows you how TLA plus works and why it's so effective. And I'd like to also show you an example that might be something you might actually encounter in your day-to-day -day life, not just something highly theoretical or very, very specific. So here's the example I want to use. Who here has worked with like an ETL? Once again, I realized that I can't actually get anybody's reactions. So essentially what's happening is in these systems, we can represent it as follows. I am uploading a piece of, I am upload, making an upload, essentially a file to a third party system. And then I want to take that file and transform it into a content. Say this might involve uploading a video and then a worker transcoding the video. Or I upload a markdown file and it turns it into a news article. I don't really care what I'm doing here. All I care about is that I have some sort of upload that is transformed into some form of content. Now, I also want to make it possible to delete uploads to essentially pull an article from publication. So I should be able to delete the upload and then the worker deletes the content. Finally, I can edit uploads where I can change the information in the upload and the content should be correspondingly changed. Now, if this process takes a long time, like we're doing something fairly intense, we want this to be asynchronous. I should be able to make the upload and not have to wait for the worker and not have to like be constantly connected while the worker does its duty. I should be able to make the upload and then leave and come back and everything's good. So this should be asynchronous. We'll assume that everything is put onto a perfect first in first out queue. No drops, no reorderings, no multiple deliveries. Then, because a lot of people might be using this system, it should be possible to scale it. So we just don't want one worker, we want to have any number of workers. This is the system we're going to model. But first, a couple of things I want to clarify. One, 
we're writing a design. We are not writing code. Specifications do not check code. They're here to help us influence the code we write. So essentially, you're still going to have to do the hard work of actually translating the spec into valid code and testing that code. I'm not promising snake oil here. Two, there's multiple ways that people write TLA plus. And for this example, I'm going to be using something, something called pluscal, which is a higher level language that compiles to pure TLA plus. Most people who work with it tend to switch between a few different tools. They're all pretty easy to learn. And finally, mathematical syntax inspired by logic and mathematics. This is pretty quick to pick up, but I don't want to sort of confuse anybody during this talk. So I changed all of the TLA plus syntax to look something more like Python. I did not change the structure of the spec, just how it looks. You can see the original spec here. Okay, with that, it's finally time to actually model the spec. Step one, imports. Step two, variables. Uploads and content are sets of values. Q is going to be a list, and next ID, which we're going to use to make kinds of information unique, is just a number. We create send message as a function that appends a new message to the queue. All the message will be here is the ID of the content we're working on and the action we're supposed to take. Now, our system has two parts to it. There's the worker, but there's also the person, the person interacting with the spec. In a program, I could say what a person could do and how it affects things, but I couldn't actually model the person doing it. I could essentially say, if this function is called with these parameters, do this. In TLA plus though, I can make the person an independent agent. I'm just checking again, the moderator to make sure like I'm, yeah. Oh, apparently I was slouching a bit. My apologies. Um, remote talks. So the person can, so we basically have an independent agent right now, which is the person. We can basically model this in TLA plus pretty straightforwardly. All we just say is that they're an independent agent in the system. We're going to allow the person to either create, edit, or delete. But we're also going to allow them to do whichever one they want. This is going to be a non-deterministic choice. They can choose to create, or they can choose to edit, or they can choose to delete content. We do this using the either or construct. This tells TLA plus to split the timeline to choose one of these three things to do. In practice, the model checker will create a separate run for each possibility each time it reaches it. So if we have two cycles, this could be up to nine different behaviors it's checking. If we have 10 cycles, it's three to the 10. So first with create. Because we're working at a very high level, all we do is we represent a we represent the, the upload as just who it's from, the ID that makes it unique, and the version, which we'll use for editing. All we have to do to create is just create an upload, add it to the set, and then send a message to the worker saying, hey, I created this particular upload. Then we just increment the um, ID, so that way the next piece of content will be distinct. Again, this isn't containing any detail of what we're actually creating. It's not giving us the image. It's not telling us what the actual text is. We're not worrying about that. We're working at a very high level here. Then delete is similar. We want to remove an upload and then send a message saying, hey, we deleted this. The difference between deleting and creating, though, is that with delete, I can choose what I'm going to be changing, right? Sorry, I'm just checking to make, I'm also just checking on what remote. It's difficult to sort of run it, yeah. So the difference is that if I upload two pieces of content, I can choose which one I want to delete, right? So I have to allow a person to non-deterministically pick. We do this using within as a special construct. If I write with delete in ABC, the model tracker could choose delete A or delete B or delete C. Edit just uses both of those. We pick an upload that we want to edit, then we decide, which we do non-deterministically, then we choose what we actually, then we basically just create an edit um, that we're going to be changing. We bump the version to represent different content. Again, we're just thinking at a high level here. We don't have to worry about the actual change we're making, just that we're making a change. 
Then we remove the old version from uploads, add the edit to it, and then we send a message to the worker saying, hey, we edited this ID. And that's it, that takes care of the user. We now have represented everything the user can do in the system. Now it's time for the worker. We're going to model how the worker takes the messages and produces content. So first we wait for there to actually be mess. We wait for there to actually be messages. Then we pop a message from the queue and then process it. For processing it, we read the action and decide what we actually do from it. We, if we get a create message, we do this create thing. If we edit, we do this edit thing. And for delete, we do delete. Now, these green things are what we call labels. They represent points of atomicity. So what happens is that if the user message is trying to create something, before it actually does the create, what happens is other things can run. Other workers can do things. Other users can do things. This allows us to model concurrency very elegantly. Notice here that I'm making edit not, um, non-atomic. We have to spend some time producing the new edit and push it. This will be important later. This means that another a worker can do something in between us starting the edit and finishing the edit. And then delete's just normal. For creation, what we want to do is we want to take the upload that corresponds to the message ID and then create the corresponding content. To find the message, we use this cool thing called choose. Choose is essentially like find. It just pulls something from the set that matches a criteria. In this case, we just pull the upload that matches the ID. Then for create, what we do is we just take that upload and dump it in the content. That's it. We're done. Delete is similar. We just find the upload and then delete it. Remove it from content. Then Edit is a little bit here. This is because it's not atomically. So in the first step, we remove the current version from content. And in the second step, we have a new version to content. And that's it. That represents the worker. We now have essentially a very simple specification of how our Intel works. Now, I haven't actually given it any properties yet. I haven't told it what must be true of the system. But I can still actually check it. I can still actually use the model checker to find bugs. We can check it for what's called comprehensiveness. Did I specify what this to do in every circumstance? Is there any possibility of getting a message where it's not clear how to handle it? I can't. All I do is I take the parameters. I say there's one worker and one user. Then I go into an IDE called the TLA plus toolbox, which essentially is the IDE that everybody uses. And I run the model checker. I'm, next, I'm now going to show, hopefully the connection works, I'm going to show what it looks like to actually run the model checker to see if there's a bug. And of course, since I'm showing you this, there must be a bug. Checking to make sure there's cool. So oh, as you saw, what happened is for a bit, and then this thing appeared on the side. I'll make that a tiny bit bigger, just a bit. This is the error trace. The top here is actual. Then the bottom here is the set of steps required to reproduce the bug to get to a situation where it's not clear what should happen next. In this case, it's a pretty create an upload. And then before the worker receives the create message, we delete the upload. The worker receives the create message. It looks for upload number one and can't find it. There's a lot of things we could do here, but we didn't say what should happen. This is a bug. It's a flaw in our design. Now there's a lot of things we could do. I'm going to take the easy way out and just say that we, if it doesn't exist, if we can't find it, just drop the message. Just don't worry about it. If the upload exists, then we create the corresponding content. If it doesn't exist, then we just ignore it. I would probably want to do something more sophisticated in like a real app, but again, this is just an example. If I make this change, then the system works fine. I don't get an error. 
Now we know my spec is fully comprehensive, I've explained what it should do in all circumstances. Now it's time to see if what it actually does, what I've told it to do, gives me the properties I want. I can express both properties on the state space and on the behavior space. But because I think everybody's sort of familiar with state properties, I'm going to focus on, right now, the more complicated thing, which is behavior properties, properties over the whole timeline of the system. I'm going to define a property saying that there's no orphan content. If I edit an upload, the corresponding piece of content should also bump version eventually. If I delete an upload, the corresponding piece of content should also be deleted. I read this as saying that for every content piece of content, there must exist an upload that has the same version, same ID, and same user. But remember, this is all synchronous. This doesn't have to be true for every individual state. It only has to be true for the behavior. I enforce this by writing this. This square diamond says event um, always eventually. And what this says is that it's allowed to be false for short periods of time, but must eventually come back to true. This makes it over behaviors and not just states. Now, do we satisfy this property? If this was a live talk, I would have somebody try to shout it out, but can't. Answer is no, it does not satisfy it. But it doesn't satisfy it for a very particular interesting reason, which is this thing called stuttering. Corresponds to this bug. User creates an upload. The worker receives the create message. Worker creates the content. User deletes the upload. Worker receives the delete. Then the worker crashes. Partial failure is inevitable in distributed systems. If we do not explicitly tell TLA plus that things cannot crash, it just assumes that things can crash whenever. Again, how we fix this is probably very dependent on our system. For now, I'm just going to write an assumption saying, hey, this cannot crash. I do this by saying it's fair. It's now a fair worker. This says it will always try to make progress. It will not just randomly fail on us. This fixes the issue. So now we have a working spec for one worker. But I want this to scale. I want there to be many workers. Testing this, because this creates a, such a much larger state space, is very, very difficult in the program, making sure that every possibility is safe. In TLA+, all I do is I just tell it, hey, remember how I said there could be one worker? There now can be two. That's it. That's the entire test I have to write. That's the only change. Now, I assume you're all, you're all, you're all smart people. You know I'm basically laying a trap here. Of course this is going to fail. We all know this is going to fail. Otherwise, I would not bring this up. The more interesting question, how many steps does it take to fail? How many things have to go wrong in the right order for us to break this property? This one I actually want you to think about. So I'll give you about 20 seconds, 15 seconds. Checking. Okay. Okay, you all have an answer? How many of you guessed 15? It takes 15 steps for the system to break. Specifically, it has to have a very specific race condition. We have to, a user has to make two back-to-back -back edits, and both edits have to be received by different workers, and they have to interleave their non-atomic editing. One has to pull the content before the other one tries to push its edit. In this particular case, what happens is it's possible for us to have the upload on version 3, but the content to remain stuck on version 2. Very, very specific race condition that would be very hard to find in a real system because things have to go wrong in just the right order. But it could happen. Remember, all behaviors eventually happen, and this will probably piss off one of our users. So one way we could fix this is we can say, hey, before we push new content, make sure it is uh, it actually matches the version of the upload. Maybe if Make sure that like the upload hasn't been bumped while we were editing and doing the non-atomic update. If it has been bumped, then we just go back and repeat the process. We try to grab the new version and upload it. And it turns out this actually does fix the bug. We no longer have that 15-step error. We just have a completely different 15-step error. And this one's actually caused by deletion. 
what happens is that while we, oh, is it, I think the um, screen might have frozen for a second. Um, okay, so I'm not seeing actually it update on my end. Um, I'm checking quickly the worker. I'm not seeing anything there. Okay, basically I'll just describe it while this is going on. The worker creates, oh yeah, it just jumped like three steps. Uh, so what happens essentially is that the, um, is that the worker can push an edit and then while it's editing it, the user deletes it. And then what happens is that we delete the content, the upload, the deleter tries, um, gets rid of it, like tries to get rid of it, doesn't see it's gone, just ignores it. And then the first worker pushes the edit. And now we have orphan content. We have upload that was deleted, but the content is not deleted. It's stuck around forever. If I add a batch job that runs nightly, that deletes content that doesn't match any ID of an upload, then this fixes the error. But interestingly, we've now added two changes that have together fixed the error. We don't necessarily know if the first change was necessary. Maybe we just needed the second one and the, super and the first one was superfluous. In a programming language, this probably would take us a long time to reach with lots of production fires, and it would be hard to test to see if something was necessary. So we might just leave the extra complexity in. In TLA plus though, it's like two minutes to just take out the old code, see if that still works, and it doesn't. Turns out we need both changes to fix the issue. This is really easy to test in TLA plus. Adding additional things like, I don't know, an imperfect queue or user authentication or other agents in the system is also pretty easy. We can just in a few minutes add any complications, any complications we want to the system and then tell, tell TLA plus to check it. That's pretty cool in my opinion. It gives us a lot of power to analyze the designs of our systems. Now, I wouldn't really be telling you this if I also didn't believe it worked in reality and not just an example. So for the last major section, I want to talk about some of the use that we've seen in the industry of these tools. The first high profile user is Amazon Web Services. They published a paper in 2014 called Use of Formal Methods at AWS. They were applying TLA plus to parts of S3 and DynamoDB. And they found a lot of bugs this way very quickly. In fact, one of the bugs they said they found was 35 steps. It was a 35 step bug that could have lost data that not only was that complicated, but it passed their design reviews, their testing, their code review. So all the tools they had in place wouldn't have caught it. It would have actually gone to production until they modeled it. One engineer estimated off the record um, on Hacker News that it saved about two months of time on the project. This was probably the first high profile use of TLA plus in the industry. And it got a lot of people inspired, including me. And I wasn't quite working at Amazon Web Services when I did this. I was actually working for a small company in ed the education sector. We did iPad apps for schools. Not the thing that you'd really expect to see formal methods being used, but we had an accidentally distributed system due to some complication between our system the school servers, the iPads, Apple, and what's called a mobile device manager, which controls the iPads, we get all sorts of really crazy partial failures and concurrency issues and race conditions and angry customers. This had been a problem plaguing us for a long time. And we'd been using a lot of extensive testing and code review and architectural planning to deal with it. And it didn't quite help. Eventually we sort of got fed up and tried to use formal methods, TLA plus. And it started catching bugs that we never even thought possible, but corresponded to actual issues we saw in production. It took, it was actually pretty quick for us to fix these once we realized they were there. And customers actually started telling us they saw a lot more robustness in our systems that they seemed to be working much more stably and were much more pleasant to use. So completely like away from anything that you'd expect to be seeing this kind of work done but it probably saved us an estimate about 200,000 US dollars a year. The final thing I wanna talk, this is actually what inspired me to sort of do this full time because I just saw how powerful and underused these tools were. The final example I like to bring up is just a really fun one from Elasticsearch. Elastic was modeling, somebody at Elasticsearch was modeling the replication engine and found in Elasticsearch, I believe, version 57, no, um, version like um, 
that there was a replication bug where you could actually have duplicate entries. They'd never seen this in the wild, but they found it using the formal model. They fixed it in 6.3. About three months after that, somebody posted an issue on GitHub saying, hey, we found some documents got replicated and we're having ID collisions. Turns out they're running 6.2. So not only did this sort of save them like a major bug in the new version, but also what happened was it saved them much of time spent debugging. They saw the bug and said, wait, that looks exactly like the thing we could call with our formal model and we're able to fix it. Now, these aren't the only examples I have. I also have a lot of ones like private clients, but these are the ones that I find are just sort of the most interesting to me. So in conclusion, distributed systems, terrible. Specification helps. It doesn't fix things. It doesn't make everything perfect, but it can help. And that's useful. And TLA plus as a tool in this space can be pretty effective and neat. So last part, last short part, I just want to talk about if this interests you, how you can sort of learn more about this, how you can actually start using it yourself. So the first resource is this book that I think Andre showed and I'll show too called Practical TLA Plus. I wrote it. It's designed to be approachable to people who have no experience in our beginner level. It's got tons of practical examples like MapReduce, how, like how to do like business domain logic, how to do rate limiting, et cetera. It's available. It's, you can also go to a link at is.gd slash PTLA plus to get it. Or if you want a fairly large discount on the book, just talk to me afterwards. I'll happily give you a very, very large discount. So in addition to that, there's um, the next book that I'd recommend is by Leslie Lamport himself, Specifying Systems. It's more intermediate level. So it's, I'd say a, second, a, good, a good second book to read after mine. It's the canonical text that also really heavily covers the theory. He also has a video course online that's free. And this book actually, if you go to his website, is also freely available. And then normally here, I'd basically say, hey, you can also just hire me as a consultant. But like two problems right now. One is that coronavirus means I can't exactly leave the United States, given how badly we've botched um, the, the entire plague thing. And also, I think you're eight hours ahead of me. So while I do online workshops, it would probably be like kind of hellish for you to be doing something at 1 a.m. Um, I mean, I do have one available online. I can talk to you afterwards about that. But like selling myself, probably not the right time or place right now. That's all I really have, actually. So I'm happy to answer any questions people have. Again, there's a link over here um, for both seeing the talk and here for the book. And other than that, I am happy to spend any time answering questions. And thank you so much for letting me talk. Thank you, Hilo. Uh, there are actually questions from the audience in the chat. And I'll Excellent. start asking them. Uh, OK. Just need, yeah. So, Just so the out. question, how is yeah. TLC uh, uh, is different from the Petri nets in terms of possibility of check, check models, so like how they compare? Um, so I want to ask a couple questions. Is the person here familiar with PetriNets, and do they want a broad answer or a very painfully in-depth technical answer? Let's start with the broad answer, and if there is a follow-up, we'll expand on that. Thing. Yeah. Okay, so PetriNets are essentially a way of extending um, definite finite state machines, and they are what's called tractable, which means that they can very easily be analyzed for properties. They're also incredibly limited. For example, um, unless you sort of do some like really complicated extensions, you don't have strings, you don't have numbers beyond like simple counting integers, you don't have conditionals. They're designed to be as simple a model of concurrency as you can get, while also being able to sort of get some interesting properties. TLA plus, it's basically much more like useful in a mathematical and like very specific academic context. TLA plus tends to be more designed for sort of working engineers, so it has things like addition, multiplication, sequences, lists, dictionaries. It's also not like fully tractable in the same way pet Petri nets are. That's the cost of expressivity. Okay, and, I just follow up. Can get way more painfully technical. I'm just going to stop there. For myself, like you still can like uh, what he's saying is that the Petri nets are like limited in terms of the things they can express, but you can still uh, basically check the properties I, like safety and liveness with it, right? Oh yes, totally. Oh yes, totally. Um, but I'm saying that for like a lot of systems that people like try to model of like in the industry that you have to, you have to add, start adding start adding like extensions like colors and inhibitor arcs that make that sort of get you further away from like the things that petrinets are best for. Petrinets are cool. Okay. I like them a lot. They're a lot of fun. Uh, the next question: 
how does the checker actually works? Uh, like what the TLC, okay. how does it actually works? So not in great detail. Dep- yeah. Overview. Oh yeah. Brute force, um, search the entire state space. Note that this does cause there, like one thing I didn't talk about in the talk is like, how is that you do need some like finesse and experience to deal with like unbounded state spaces where there's an infinite number of possible states because essentially TLC is a brute force checker. It just checks every possible state and behavior. Okay, so it is a brute force. Uh... Yes, um, not all formal methods do that. A lot of them are much more sophisticated, but TLC like has, again, there's a lot of technical stuff here that I'm going to just stop right now. <laughs> okay, but there are like heuristics as far as I remember with regards like symmetric sets and stuff like that. To oh yes, totally. Reduce the state space. Yeah, so it's not like completely brute force, but like the general idea is just a brute force. Yeah, and currently I believe some people are working on what's called Avalanche, which is like designed to be an extension that uses um, SMT solving in addition to brute force checking. But that's still, For plus. It's, that's still like exotic. Yeah, it's still like an exotic research project. It hasn't like been integrated yet. Okay. Uh... Uh, the next question, how do you see the future of TLA plus? Are there newer languages, new model checkers? Okay. So that is a very good question. So one of the interesting, like, and this is going to get a bit more into sort of personal things. There's the short term and the long term. Short term, one of the big challenges in TLA plus and the formal methods community in general is that there's been a lot more work on the fundamentals versus the polish, the UX, the education. I've been sort of trying to do a lot of work in that space. That's sort of what I've been known for is like making it more accessible, writing documentation. Um, I've been working in a different formal language called Alloy on like basically making it more integratable with, with continuous integration systems, et cetera. Um, so that's like near term work that I think will help with the future. More broadly, this is still like a very small cutting edge field. And what happens is that a lot of the innovation in the field starts to happen once more people get into it. You get more people, more ideas being exchanged, more people trying to apply it in different ways. And the more people start using these tools, the more interesting stuff people do, and that makes it hard to predict the future. So I think what's going to happen is that things are going to be more widely used and more accessible, but I don't know what it will be that's more widely used. Does that I answer think, the question? Uh, uh, what about newer languages? Do you see like completely different TLA++ plus plus, or I don't know. Um, yeah, so I mentioned um, PlusCal, which is a TLA plus, a language that compiles down to TLA plus. That was written, I believe, in 2011 as a way of making it more extensible for um, use in like um, CSP style like problems and also making it more accessible to beginners. Um, I have seen other work, for example, I know that people are currently writing a, like a closure system that compiles to TLA plus. Um, and that's like in the space of TLA plus, like potential things in the future. And then there's other languages sort of on the horizon. Um, there was one really cool one I was following for a while called Runway, but then the guy who was working that was basically just snatched up by Amazon. And I think all that work became um, proprietary. Very sad. Runway isn't the one the the guy is Diego Angara, not? Yeah, he, yeah, same is guy he? who did Raft. Um, he was working on it for a while for Salesforce, and then he was um. Then he was, I think, poached by Amazon, and I think work on um, Runway stopped. I think it's still like around, but um, apparently yeah. he was just consumed with his new work. Yeah, I saw this too. Uh, I thought he stopped a while ago, and uh, like improving yeah. Runway. I, uh, I, I I will admit that I'm not like I'm not like 100 like clear on the exact timeline. I'm just I guess what I'm just trying to say here is that like people are constantly working on ways of either making existing languages better or making new languages in this space. So like it's not it's not a static field. It's very dynamic and very alive. Okay. Uh, next question: What should I do to check real software having code lines using TLA plus? So could you repeat the question? Uh, what they do to check real software uh, with billions of lines code lines with TLA plus. How do I check that? Like basically, what I would ask like how do you have a large existing project, how do they use TLA plus? Um, so TLA plus is, yeah. So TLA plus is essentially designed to exist distinct from the code. It is a um, it is basically a design tool. And this is actually an advantage because 
there are tools designed to work directly between the code and like the spec. And what happens is they have to be like very closely integrated with specific languages. For example, like Framacy works only on C code. And by having sort of like an independent thing, it makes it more easy to integrate into more projects. That said, there is work being done on basically trying to translate between, I think the main thing people are working on is Java and TLA plus, Elasticsearch has been doing a lot of that, but that's still like research. Until then, the thing that I have to emphasize is that this isn't magic, it doesn't solve everything for you. You're still going to have to use code review, you're still going to have to do architectural planning, you're still going to have to write tests. If you have an existing code base, um, often what I found is helpful is to spec out parts you already know as a way of both improving the language and creating executable documentation. That said, I also know several people who started doing this and then found critical issues in the legacy systems. So, um, you know, trade-offs. Okay, but how do you approach the whole, like, I have a large system with a lot of things in there and I want to, I have the small part I know about. How do you, like, pro like, are there any, any specific requirements on this particular part you want to model check? Are there, like, things you should be aware before you even start? Oh, yeah. Okay. So the, basically, that's a technique, a good question, called refinement of basically talking about being able to talk about a system at different levels of abstraction. So what usually happens is you might want to say, okay, so here's my big overall system. Here's a small part I really care about. For the big system, I'm just going to sort of loosely sketch it in. I'll assume this always works perfectly. I'll say this always returns the right result. I'll say that this just happens to be like magically the exact thing I need. And then for this small part, I will focus on the properties and talk about the exact things I want to guarantee and how it should like actually try to do the steps it takes. So for the things that like at the high level, I'll just say certain parts always are correct and just give me the answer I want. Other parts I'll have to actually explain how it gets the answer I want. Does that answer the question or am I misunderstanding the question? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, two, 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 two. Uh, let's, I, we don't have any more questions from the audience. So if anyone wants, uh, ask questions, uh, please use the telegram chat, but I have prepared questions of my own. So I'll just ask those. Okay. And the next one is going to be like kind of in the same, uh, area we just discussed, like, what do you think stopping people from using formal methods? What's the like biggest hurdle? Um, UX mostly. One UX? of the things that we've noticed, so, in, yeah, user experience. So like one of the things we've noticed in multiple fields is that, okay, actually I like to give this as an example, like, do you floss? Yes. Okay. So it turns out that like, mo like about, I'd say, at least in the United States, less like about 40% of people don't floss, like just because, and it's like five minutes, right? To just like floss. It's just because flossing it is really annoying. Yeah. And that stops root canals. It stops you from having to like get like your teeth pulled out. It, UX is incredibly important to making sure people use tools. And again, as I mentioned, as like a very, like UX in pretty much any community, like any community we talk about is one of the last things people think about, user experience and security. And given that like the formats community has been so small for so long and by like mostly done by experts talking with other experts, UX designed to make it, a, make it accessible by people outside of those niches hasn't been like the main focus. Um, one example I like to give of this is that um, I wrote that book, Practical TLA Plus, which I just threw across the room. That was like the first like book designed to be accessible to people who weren't already mathematically like experienced. Things like that. Those are currently the biggest barriers to why people aren't using it. Is just we haven't yet worked to make it pleasant and easy to use. Okay. So do, do you think it's gonna improve with like more people going into formal methods and basically trying to absolutely things and like community growing? Absolutely. Let me just give one example. A lot of people I know now use um, the Visual Studio Code extensions for formal methods because now there's stuff for like TLA plus and a few other languages. It lets you use it through um, VS Code as opposed to through an ID, the dedicated IDs. That only happened because people who got interested because of other accessibility improvements realized, hey, I can make this even more useful by like making extensions for editors. And that's helped a lot, actually. A lot of people use those now. So we do, we are actually empirically seeing that as more people get interested, the usability does improve. Okay. There's also uh, do you see like the language itself as being uh, one of the usability issues? 
TLA plus language because it, it is I... uh, quite different from like regular C style languages. Um, I was I was just to make I was just about to make a um United States Constitution joke, so um I am not going to confirm or deny any claims about that. Okay. <laughs> Actually, is this is this recorded? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, I'm not fair going enough, to confirm or like, deny yeah, any claims about answer, that. <laughs> yeah, your answer was fair enough. Uh, yeah. Okay, you just mentioned about uh, that the uh, your book is probably the first one with. Uh, for people who are not already mathematicians and want to use formal methods, uh, but uh, do you, like what kind of like mathematical background one needs to have to like use them maybe effectively, or like is there math you have to know to even start using formal um, methods? You don't have to use all that much math. Like basically, actually, the book has one of the first appendixes: the math you need to know, and it's just propositional logic, like true and false, and implication basic set theory of like sets, subsets, intersections, and predicate logic of for all and exists. That's all sort of, it's introduced gradually through the book and it's also all covered in the back in an appendix. When I said that like, it's one of the first books in TLA plus designed to be accessible, I mean like specifying systems sort of assumes that you know how to like structure a proof. Like it says, okay, yeah, so we have this property of liveness. Here's the proof that this property holds. That's like what I'm talking about in terms of like mathematically inclined. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, we also all already talked about like using formal methods in uh, industry setting and improving UX. Uh, do you like? Uh, do you see like in the whatever? Let's dream a bit. Uh, in the future, formal methods will become as ubiquitous or as unit testing, for example. No. No. And the reason I say that is because um, unit testing is incredibly easy to do. And it's not like, it's also not universal, right? Like, there's plenty of people who just don't write unit tests. And there's plenty of companies that just don't really do it. So, like, I expect, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm not going to make any predictions. I'm hopeful that TLA plus, that like formal methods in general will be useful enough that most people have heard of it and know somebody who does it. But I do not believe that based on how like economics works, how industry works, that everybody will be doing it. And I think that would probably be like a bad goal for any community, really, to try to make it as ubiquitous as like unit testing. Okay, uh, that's interesting. Like I didn't expect mm -hmm. uh, you saying this is a bad goal for community, but I see your point now. I know. I, I think it's important for the goal uh, to like have a vibrant community of people who use it, and for people to know about the community and be able to easily enter it if they want to. But I mean, look what happened to you. like if if something tries to get like tries to become ubiquitous, it's a very good chance that people are just going to burn out, or you know, it's going to become like it's just not going to work out. You, it, it's not going to be good. You know what I'm saying? You have, you have to think uh, about all exactly. these like, like, I'm still comparing to like unit testing and like, yeah, yeah. Originally, I remember like the first time I saw people doing unit testing, it was like three engineers uh, at the same computer and they're like trying to figure things out, how it works, like what mm -hmm. they should, should they do? And like, what's the value in this? Right now it's like basically everyone does this as far as I can see at least. Uh, and like the there are not that like the uh, different languages and different lang different support for unit testing, but like probably Java is the mm -hmm. uh, advanced one. So like uh, mm -hmm. and everyone knows how to do that. It's like con considered like one of the basic skills. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though people started with uh, when like we don't even know what it is, we have like five unit tests for hundred thousand lines of code, and it still con mm -hmm. was considered good. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good point. I think from my understanding, like it is very popular, but there's a large amount of dark matter code that doesn't really use unit testing, especially like outside of like the tech sphere of like the tech industry. But I do not know enough okay. about sort of yeah. the ubiquity and the popularity to make a comment there. Um, so I will reserve comparisons to unit testing as just, I do not have enough information there. Uh, okay. Uh, 
what, what like uh, you mentioned that even though formal methods give you some confidence over your system, you still have to do code reviews, testing, design reviews, architectural reviews, and all that. Basically, yeah. uh, things you were doing before. What do you think like the mm -hmm. complementary things you should do with formal methods, like things which help find bugs formal methods miss and vice versa? Um, so some things that I find, so basically formal methods works really well at the design level. It tends to say very little about the implementation level, at least the formal methods I talked about here. There's some formal methods that are designed to be more end to end. I'm sort of excluding those for reasons. Um, so unit testing, very good. Property testing, very good. Fuzzing, great. Static analysis, type systems, pretty handy. Checklists, deployment things, having a sane work environment, getting enough sleep. As I mentioned, code review, talking constantly with clients, like all the things that we know are good right now remain good if you add formal methods. Okay, they all remain good. Uh, but what yeah. what should be there? So like you add formal methods, maybe you can like basically what what I'm trying to say is like uh, people are sometimes reluctant then. Uh, some consultant comes in and says like you've been doing all those things but there is one more thing you should be doing and this will mm -hmm. help you with what like if i'm doing all those things already and there is one more thing i should i'm adding to the mix i should maybe cut somewhere like maybe do less unit testing maybe mm -hmm. i don't know do less something uh of something like where is the thing like where i'm getting my like flag back <laughs> I see what you're saying. Um, so the this is actually an interesting question because the answer that like sort of we've seen empirically is not a very convincing answer. Which is that the answer we've seen empirically is that it just it turns out that the amount of time it saves on design and like rework is significant enough that you end up saving time by adding formal methods in. But no one's going to believe that if you just tell them outright, right? Yeah. So what I say exactly is that my point. Formal, yeah. So what I'd say in that case is that formal methods is designed to sort of help you do less of other kinds of design. You don't have to spend as much time drawing diagrams or like writing English requirement diagrams. In fact, actually, here's a fun thing, not necessarily TLA+, but other tools. What it can do is it can generate diagrams for you. So you can say, yeah, here's my spec. Give me a bunch of diagrams of like different ways that the system can be organized that I can then give to a client. So it's, it's basically, I guess what I'd say is it helps time on Save times saves time on requirements gathering, architectural design, um, architectural review, etc. Does that answer the question, or? Yeah, I think it, it's a fair answer. Uh... It also, I've also seen people use it to generate unit tests, which is actually can be really helpful. Of just saying, okay, here's my spec. Based on the error examples, generate integration tests for me. Here's the integration test I need to write, which is a bit more of a, I think, a sophisticated use case that I wouldn't necessarily assume that everybody would be able to immediately do but it's available like do they actually generate like code or generate like input data for integration tests or scenarios something like that S generate scenarios okay and then there's like yeah. some you implement some kind of interpreter for the scenarios generated by tla plus i believe that's what they did i like okay uh uh some other thing. Uh, uh, some other thing, like maybe out of space of the uh, formal, but to the still uh, about the quality. Uh, you wrote the blog post about metamorphic testing, which is a very mm -hmm. cool technique. Uh, and as far as I can tell, not known in industry at all. So, like, very few people yeah. know about it. Can you tell more about this? Okay, so um, jumping topics a bit. So metamorphic testing is actually yeah. a really simple, it's actually an incredibly simple technique. The idea is that it's writing tests where instead of saying, here's my input, here's my expected output, you say, given these relations between inputs, we should have these relations between outputs. The standard example people give is that if I recognize, if a computer vision system recognizes this as a water bottle, it should also recognize this as a water bottle and this as a water bottle, right? That's basically metamorphic yeah. testing to say that basically the the, the 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 computer vision result for this should I should be the same as this, whether or not it's a water bottle or whatever. It should be immune to rotations. 
Um, this is a very effective technique, actually, and as mentioned in Sami blog, I can include a link in the discussion afterwards to it. The main reason it isn't widely used is because um, almost all of the information on it is behind um, academic journal paywalls. So you have to spend either a lot of time just emailing the people involved or like having a journal access or like scrounging preprints. And I've we've been doing more in at least in that space to make it more accessible without having to like be part of university. Okay. Uh uh, do you see a similar gap between like academia and industry informal methods? Like because it's also kind of more of academic technique in general? Um, potentially. The difference there, I believe, is that a lot of the formal methods is that is that um, metamorphic testing is a technique, right? So it's something that you think about and then you apply a technique. A lot of the formal method stuff are also tools, and most of those tools are freely available. So it is possible, it is easier to sort of get started and learn the basics because those tools already exist versus having to learn like how to do something. Does that make sense as a difference? Actually, like it makes sense, but I would completely reverse an argument <laughs> because if it's just an idea, I can apply it anywhere at like any scale. But if there are tools right, right. But... Uh, for like formal methods, I have to kind of retrofit the tool into my software oh, totally true. But, but like with an idea, you have to hear the idea to like have the idea, right? Like most yeah. people haven't heard of, um, yeah, that's what I'm sort of thinking. Like it's but easier to find easily. Yeah. But yeah, that's why, no, that's why I think metamorphic testing is going to become like really big soon because once we can get the idea outside of those like academic paywalls then people are going to be spreading that idea. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's great. Actually. Yeah. I, I also like when I first read it, uh, your blog about on metamorphic testing. I was like, I've been doing this like a couple times. I never knew there is a word for this, and there is like huge body of research. Yeah, this was cool. And it's it, and it's and like, the, so the challenge there is just ex getting more people to know about it first, getting more people to learn how to use it. Also, I think that we might have run out of time, so we might have to switch to discussion. Is that the case? No, you have a little bit, like half a minute, approximately. So. But I think okay. you almost answered uh, the, the last question, right? You can like say say uh, more words about metamorphic yeah, testing, I've... a little bit. Well, um, if you want to add something in like regarding your talk or like some something you want to mention. Thank you so much for letting me talk. I understand it's difficult to be running like a remote conference and that there's challenges both as speakers and as organizers and as like the audience. So I'm glad you were all, we, were, we were all able to make this work and I hope that you all enjoyed the talk and found it useful. It seems that the audience really enjoyed the talk. So it's like 80% amazing out of three, three types, ordinary and decent, you're 18% amazing. Hello. Okay. So that's... That's pretty amazing. That's pretty good. Okay, guys, see you in the Zoom, Zoom discussion zone. So everybody okay. go there and I leave the guys okay. yeah, alone for that. Okay, see you. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you very oh. much for your time.